Did you know that increasingly medical devices such as pacemakers and insulin pumps are smart devices? They run software and have Wi-Fi capabilities. They can collect, analyze and transmit data. But who owns those devices once they're implanted in the human body? Who owns the data that they collect and the software that they run? And how should the law deal with various problems such as risks around unauthorised third-party access and hacking of medical devices? Hello, I'm Warren Quigley and I'm Professor of Law, Medicine and Technology and I'd like to tell you about some of my work here at Birmingham on redefining the human body. My research over the last five years or so has focused on two main areas. Uh, the first of those is bodies and biomaterials. So I'm interested in how the law ought to deal with new challenges which arise when organs, tissues and cells are removed from the human body. So for example, questions like, should the source from whom biomaterials are removed be deemed to be the owner of those materials? The second area that I'm interested in is bodies and biotechnologies. So I'm interested in how the law ought to deal with difficulties that arise when medical devices, in particular smart medical devices, are implanted in or attached to the human body. So my interest in the second of these areas, bodies and biotechnologies, grew out of my earlier research on bodies and biomaterials. So if you ask people whether or not they own their bodies or whether or not uh, they own materials removed from their bodies, uh, they will often be surprised to hear that as far as the law has been traditionally concerned, the answer is no. Now this has begun to change in recent years, but the answer is still not unequivocally yes. And this is important because when the law says that uh, a person or persons own something, they're granting that they can control the use of uh, that thing. And conversely, when they say that somebody doesn't own something, they're saying that they cannot control the use of that thing. And in relation to materials removed from the body, this becomes important um, in particular circumstances. For example, when materials might be um, appropriated or used uh, in an objectionable or inappropriate manner, or when materials become damaged. So to give an example um, of damage to materials, um, a recent case which actually helped to move the law on a bit in this area was about sperm, which was held at um, a fertility unit um, this sperm had been deposited by uh, six men as they were about to undergo chemotherapy um, and they did not know if they'd retain their fertility after the uh, treatment. Um, however, the system that automatically topped up the liquid nitrogen which kept the sperm frozen failed. Um, this was not manually topped up and the sperm perished. Um, and the court then had to determine what uh, what wrong in law was done, if any, here, and what compensation, if any, was due to the men. Um, and in this case, the uh, court decided that the men had ownership of their sperm for the purposes of a claim in negligence. Um, therefore, in determining that the men had ownership of uh, the sperm, they determined they had control of it and that they were entitled to compensation because a wrong was done. So in thinking about issues like this, I realised that the problem, uh, problems for the law weren't just about materials being removed from the body, uh, they were also about materials being put into the body, implanted or attached to the body. Um, and that in the biotechnological world, materials move in and out of the body. Um, and this is a problem that has come about because of advancing technology, uh, which was something the law didn't traditionally have to deal with, say, hundreds of years ago, when many of our legal rules or the basis of our current legal rules um, were put in place. So when it comes to the issue of medical devices, uh, there is absolutely no question um, that these devices are property and are owned by, for example, the manufacturers and maybe then the NHS who buy them, um, 
when they are outside the human body. But then the question arises, what happens to them once they're implanted in the body? And this is one of the questions that I'll be looking at in a new Wellcome Trust funded project that will be starting in September 2019. Um, and part of the title of this project is Everyday Cyborgs. Um, and for the purposes of this project, an everyday cyborg is a person with an attached or implanted medical device. And I call them every day to focus on the fact that they are about medical devices which people are using for illnesses that they've got now and to distinguish them from more fantastical science fiction type scenarios. Although obviously as technology advances, these do shade into what were once science fiction scenarios. So as well as questions about who ought to own implanted devices, there's the questions that I raised at the very start of this video um, about the fact that these devices are increasingly smart devices. They run software, they have Wi-Fi capabilities. This gives rise to a number of other problems. So for example, traditionally in law, the hardware of devices is essentially separate from the software and the intellectual property of these devices. So if you buy your smartphone outright, you own the phone, but you may not know that you actually don't own uh, the software and the intellectual property rights that go with that, that run in your phone. And in fact, you can be subject to um, sanctions by, for example, the intellectual property rights holders, usually the manufacturers, um, if you breach the terms and conditions of using that device. For example, if you hack the operating system of your device or you alter it in ways um, that uh, it ought not to be altered. And in such scenarios, manufacturers can take a number of um, steps. So for example, they might deny you software updates for your phone. Or in extreme cases, they might brick your device. So to brick your device means to render it non-functional. So for example, there were cases involving Hewlett Packard and printers where um, customers had used non-proprietary inks. Uh, the software in the device detected this and rendered the printers non-functional. Now, these are kind of common clauses in the terms of conditions of smart devices, which we use every day. Um, but you can imagine that this would be problematic um, with regards to medical devices that are implanted in the human body. So part of what um, I'm going to look at and what my team are going to look at is how ought um, we to view the software in medical devices? What ought manufacturers and intellectual property rights holders be allowed to do? What sorts of terms and conditions ought they be allowed to impose on people who breach the terms and conditions of those devices? Now, this isn't just an abstract problem. Um, for example, there's a community of insulin pump users who hack their pumps. And the reason they do that is they're not happy with the level of insulin control and glucose control that they're getting from their insulin pumps as they currently function. And they download open source software, which connects their pumps to a continuous glucose monitor, um, giving them much better control over their glucose in their bloodstream as the day goes on because essentially the glucose monitor now continuously talks to the insulin pump and it makes micro adjustments um, often on a minute by minute basis. However, what would happen if something went wrong with one of these devices? What if it gave a larger insulin dose um, than the person actually required and they were rendered seriously ill or even died? Who's liable in this situation? Is it the person who downloaded the uh, open source software because they did this voluntarily? Is it the person who wrote the code in the first place because in fact their code had a, had a problem in it or a glitch in it? Or is it the manufacturer because they didn't in fact ensure that the security of their devices was enough to prevent people from hacking it? There are also other issues. Um, potentially with devices. So for example, uh, Dick Cheney, who was uh, the ex-Vice President of the United States, 
had the Wi-Fi in his pacemaker disabled because he was worried about remote assassination attacks. Um, it's been demonstrated that pacemakers um, have got a security loopholes which can be quite easily exploited um, and at least currently at close quarters um, can be hacked. Um, how should the law respond to this? Uh, what should the obligations of manufacturers be in this respect? These are just some of the questions that I'm going to be looking at with regards to smart medical devices. Um, I really hope that you found this uh, short video on my research and how I'm contributing to redefining the 21st century body here at Birmingham interesting. Um, and I'd really like to hear your thoughts on some of the things discussed. Are you an everyday cyborg? Do you have an implanted or attached medical device? Were you aware of the issues that I was discussing in this video? Um, please feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at ProfMQ, um, or you can find my email here on the Birmingham University website.